the session today is going to be devoted on what the projection here says theories and major schools of thought and framework of organizational analysis. We have had so far discussion on two components of the course. One was the nature of the subject, its scope, what are the contents and what are the features of the subject matter. It is necessary to understand this to appreciate the topics which follow. We then went into a discussion on the legacy factors of any situation and we came to the conclusion that anything which exists has a certain set of givens. There is nothing which exists without a set of givens. So, put, putting it in quantitative terms, y is never equal to mx, it is always y is equal to mx plus c and it is this c variable which needs to be decomposed for the understanding of what is a positive trait, what is a positive potential, what is a negative legacy, what is a dead weight and what needs to be eliminated. This applies to individuals, this applies to organizations and this is a reality of life which cannot be wished away. We also analyzed how the study of longitudinal thinking is a serious discipline in its own right and how many different people, how many different scholars have researched on it in different territories and what is roughly the benchmark of assumptions, theories, practices in longitudinal thinking and it is nothing new in the subject area. I want to take that discussion forward today to discuss with you as the subject says theories and major schools of thought. Now what is a theory? We shall get into a definitional analysis in a short while but to get the ball going let us recognize that we all have our theories. A theory is a set of assumptions which helps us to understand a reality. You do not have to be professionally trained to develop a theory. Everyone wants to understand things around him and as he experiences things, he develops a theory. Now, if you do it scientifically, you develop a theory which is sustainable. If you do it by hunches and like an amateur, well then obviously you get the bumps of hunches and being an amateur. But everyone has a theory. Many of us believe that all men are honest. Many of us believe all men are dishonest. Many of us believe if you get some, give some money to someone, he will not return it. Others say, no, it is not like that. So we all have a theory on everything, behavior, ethics, profession. You choose a subject based on a theory. Oh, being a mechanical engineer is wonderful these days or being an electronics engineer. There is nothing to prove it. What is more, four years down the line, it may not be anything like what you believe. People presume that two years of work in MBA will make them a specialized, a specialization will emerge. It is one of those theories which have got no basis. After two years of study in MBA, you will be barely literate to start sub understanding the subject matter. And if you think doing finance with IT is a great specialization and it will get you a great job, you will find out. And who knows what will be the jo job market two years down the line. But then you try to understand what is going around you and you develop a theory. So everyone starts studying finance with IT. You never understood finance, still less understood IT, combining it is even more complicated and believe me, you will never get a job because of the courses which you have done, you will get a job because of the capabilities which you have. And if what you have done is a capability, then all of you engineers who start doing management should be singularly incapable of doing any management. So you can see how many loopholes there are to that theory but yet you will take your decisions based upon that theory. 
So theory becomes very important. To put it in everyday parlance, therefore, theory is a set of assumptions which helps you to read meaning into a randomness of life. Now, I am giving you a working definition of theory. When you start reading meaning into what is happening around you, you develop a theory. How true that theory is will not be known till it is tested. So, there is a difference between a theory and a theorem. Why do you say QED? which means I have set out to, I have proved what I had set out to prove. Quod era demonstrandum, it is the Latin. To understand therefore, the complexities of organization management over a period of time, different generations of scholars have generated different theories. And the sensible way of understanding a subject matter is not to start with developing your own theory, but to start with understanding what are the existing theories. Am I right? You do not create a world because you believe that is the way the world should be created. You first understand how people talked of the world being created. There is one theory which says God created something out of nothing. It is a theory. There is another which says there was the Big Bang theory. Nobody was around when the so called Big Bang took place. Then there is the theory which says na sato vidyate bhava, na bhava vidyate sata. There is no matter without abstraction, and there is no abstraction without matter. Abstraction meaning energy. And that is Gita for you. It says very simply mass and energy are interchangeable. There is no matter which does not have its counterpart in energy, and there is no energy which will not have its counterpart in matter. Another theory. So, also organization management has its theories, and obviously, there is no one theory. Different people have come up with different theories, and they have all tried to reason it out. Through this session, we will walk you through some of the leading theories of organization management. It is not as if these are the only theories which exist. It is not as if these theories cannot be argued with. It is not as if these theories are mathematically established. There is a world of a difference between a mathematical theory, a theory of physics and a theory of management. Though you must realize even theories in physics are riddled with arguments and they can be demolished. The, the most common example is there was a theory that atom is the smallest element which cannot be broken up. They lived with that theory for decades and then they realized atom can be broken up. So, what did they do? They, they did not rename atom, atom remained atom, but the theory was gone. There is a linearity in theories which science subjects talk about. There is also a sequence of theories in management, but there is a difference between linearity and sequence. Linearity is a cause and an effect chain. There was this theory which says atom is the smallest element in matter which cannot be broken up. Then the theory which says an atom can be split. So, there is a linearity in that. Sequence is what came after what chronologically. And the interesting thing in social sciences is you can have similar theories propounded in different geographies parallelly without drawing upon each other. Let me repeat that, so that you understand its significance. 
there can be parallel theories or indeed similar theories in different geographies in different parts of the world without any correlation. So, it is not as if linearity is essential in a theory in management. Having explained to you some of the basic approaches to the understanding of theory, let me walk you through some of the theories and major schools of thought, which will presumably give you a framework of analysis to understand organization. Above all, the purpose of any subject is at your level of understanding to get a grasp of what it is about. Therefore, these theories will help you to develop a framework of analysis of the organization you will deal with. Because remember what I told you in the verse, very first session, whether you like it or not, you are dealing with an organization. Whether you like it or not, you exist in an organization. And whether you like it or not, you will need an organization to live and survive, eat and prosper. Or even if you choose not to prosper, you will need an organization just to be, just to exist. So organization management is one of those inevitable areas which you cannot survive without. The criticality, therefore, of understanding organization management is essential. So, whatever we take up under theory will be looked after as organization theory. And this is a full-fledged specialization. In fact, there are full-fledged courses on organization theory and practice. The key elements of organization theory is say a definition of organization theory which is to be rooted in what is a theory, a plan or a scheme existing in the mind only but based on principles verifiable by experiment or observation. What is an organization? Organizations are social entities that are goal oriented and are designed as deliberately structured and coordinated activity systems and are linked to the external environment. This is again another definition of an organization. So what is the definition of an organization theory? And I'll give you several definitions. All of them partly correct. None of them captures the full truth. But this is what you call a literature survey. This is how you will understand what is the nature of the knowledge which is available on the subject matter. Organization theory is the set of propositions, body of knowledge stemming from a definable field of study which can be termed as organization science. The study of organizations is an applied science because the resulting knowledge is relevant to the problem solving or decision making in ongoing enterprises or institutions. How did these organization theories evolve? Early examples of management, captains of industry, advent of communication channels, all these three factors helped these theories to emerge. In other words, before you start looking at the theory, you must understand how theories originate. Theories originate in early experiences, which is what is said here, early examples of management. Theories originate because somebody who is in a leadership position says that it is so. So the captains of industry in each region said, well, this is how it is. So the opinion of a leader matters. And finally, the advent of communication channels. You start disseminating what you think to others. You disseminate it through word of mouth. You disseminate it through written word. And when the electronic medium came, you disseminate it through electronic medium 
or there are other ways of doing it and since this is not a course on communication, uh, you will understand that I expect a certain background of information with you on what could be termed as advent of communication channels. The evolution of management thought is put here schematically from 1890 to roughly today. They are, they are broadly divided into classical approaches and contemporary approaches. Classical approaches are approaches with which management theory began and modern approaches are essentially or the contemporary approaches are essentially the post World War II approaches. In each case you will find that the date line has been given and in each case you find that there is an arrow which links it up with the theory. Let me walk you through them. 1890 or thereabouts there came the systematic management theory. Around 1905 there came the scientific management. Around 1915 came administrative management. Around 1925 came human relations management. 30 to 40 the intervening 10 years saw the emergence of quantitative management. 1940 people saw the origin of organizational behavior. Around 1949-50 systems theory came into full bloom. Around 1950, 56, 57, 58 contingency theory became fashionable and thereafter there has been current and future revolutions of organization theory. Now, this is just a schematic plan to show you which ones came first and which ones came after. This is not a gospel to swear by. You can have other classifications. Now that is something which is very important when you come to the study of management or behavioral sciences. Very little here is as cut and dried as it is say in a lot of engineering disciplines. But what is cut and dried in engineering disciplines itself is cut and dried only to a certain level because the, whatever is cut and dried also changes. It is not as if once you, you propound a theory of thermodynamics, the scientific theory will not change. So that also changes. So you do not have to get very worried whether everyone accepts this or everyone does not accept it. Nothing is, nothing is accepted by everyone and even that which is accepted by everyone changes. So as you reach a postgraduate level of education and learning, one of the changes which you have to internalize in your cognitive system is whatever you believe can only be a tentative belief. Whatever you believe is true only so far and no further. And most importantly, what you believe today may not be valid tomorrow. Therefore, where are you left with that then? All these theories are at best indicators to refine your thinking. All these theories are essentially a benchmark of the level of knowledge and sophistication which exists. That you can, you can always argue about it. No, systematic theory did not begin in 1890, it began in 1880. You can keep arguing about it. And then you start producing data that actually systems theory did not begin around 47, 48, but it actually began in June 41. You are welcome to it. This is not like a gospel truth. This is not like the verdict of the prophet. This is not like if you believe it, your soul will be saved. If you do not believe it, your soul will be damned. These are broad trends. 
This is bringing to your level of knowledge and understanding certain patterns which you must be aware of to take matters forward. Now, we are not going to get into details of all these theories. It's neither necessary nor useful, but then it's important for you to realize that there are different ways of looking at the same proposition because the way management was understood in 1890 is not the way management was understood in 1990. In fact, each generation has to go through the process of understanding what are the managerial issues. Pollution was never such an issue on this planet as it is today. And purity of air, water, soil today is critical to the survival of the human race. When you studied management, in the late 19th century, you could pollute whatever you wanted, however you wanted, and with gay abandon. And indeed, which is how the industrially advanced nations stole a march. They had all the advantages of waste which the countries which are trying to industrialize today don't have. And this is essentially what is at the root of all the conf confabulations which are taking place on environmental laws and why there is no agreement. You cannot say we had this advantage, we used it to the full advantage. Now that we have done it, we change the rules for everyone else. Because that is going to end in a situation of perpetuating inequality. And if you have to understand the life issues of management, you have to apply the principles of life issues to the contemporary situations. Which is what makes management the interesting subject as it is. Each generation defines its own managerial issues. Each generation has to do decision making and problem solving in the context of the resources which are available. We are living in an era where the future growth of the economy will be through natural gas and it is predicted that we are going to enter an era which will be determined by the availability of natural gas. Coal as a source of energy was developed to a point and then it plateaued out and the, whereas coal is used still today, it is an energy resource of the past unless you can have gasification of coal. Then oil entered the scene and prosperity of oil determined the political equations and the power equations not only amongst nations but also amongst corporates. Till today in technological choice, <coughs> one of the most important things is what is the source of energy of this equipment and this machine. You can't undertake technological evaluation without a grasp of two critical parameters which are common to all equipment today. One is what kind of energy source does it need? And the, the other is what kind of the nature of material which it has. So you will notice that a lot of management does require you to uh, have a grasp and an appreciation of cognate areas, which is why I have always felt that management is meant for the best. And no matter how you fancy yourself, you are quite aware of the kind of level of intelligence you have, the kind of effort which you put in, and the kind of intelligence which you have. You may say whatever you want in a social group, but when you doze off in a class, and when you are unable to recall what is being said, 
and when you don't even understand what the subject is which is being discussed, you may wake up 10 minutes later and still realize that you haven't kept up with what is being said. Real capability development requires the ability to assess your own ability and choose something which is suited to you. And since management studies are life-giving, my advice to people who force themselves into management is quit while you can. Get into something which you can manage. Otherwise, you will be doing what happens to you when you bite something which you cannot digest. Don't lead life trying to keep up with the Joneses. I must study management because everyone else is studying management. You don't have the same height, the same weight as your neighbor. Accept the facts of your life. You are worth something somewhere. Discover where you are worth. Discover where you will be successful. If you force yourself into a discipline, whatever else you may or may not be sure of, I can assure you, you are heading for disaster. So while you can, drop something which you are not capable of. The same thing applies to organizations. You can't run an organization with dated tools. You can't run an organization with principles which are dated. We live in an era where the great issue today is management of expectations. A lot of MBA students, even before they are graduate, have career expectations which are just impossible to live through. There is no way you will become the managing director of a firm in two and a half years. With the result that once you graduate, you join an organization and then you go job hopping. And believe me, job hopping doesn't make all that much of a difference. You may gain on one or two items of the salary, you will lose out on two or three other items. The summation will be the same. You will be plus or minus 10%, plus or minus 20%, never more than that. Therefore, please remember, one of the essential results of all theories of management is to help you to make your own life choices better. Of which the first assumption is, and we again go back to some of the classical learning, Atmanam Vidhi. All learning begins with know yourself. Atmanam. Self. Vidhi. No. The way you dress, what you eat, what language you speak will be totally irrelevant. Indeed, it will be very important for you to recognize that all these thoughts and theories of management have consistently over the years <coughs> missed out on the most important principle of management theory, management of self. Therefore, whatever theory you learned here and whatever theory you will pick here, please realize you are supposed to reflect on them intelligently. You are supposed to understand it so that you can practice it. And if you can neither understand it nor practice it, you should be asking whether you are a fit subject for these sessions or not. The first theory which I am going to talk to you is called the classical theory of organization management. Not that there weren't other theories, but this is usually considered the beginning of organized theory formation in organizations. Classical organization theory is rooted in the work of Frederick Taylor, 
not that I believe that uh, management begins with Frederick Taylor, but at your level of learning, it is best to keep pace with what is a general belief. If you have other beliefs, there will be other occasions to learn of it, and this is not the time to generate a debate. Frederick Taylor taught industrial engineering at Stevens Institute of Technology in New Jersey. And if you ever get there, you will find that in view of his standing in the field of management, they have got a bust of Frederick Taylor in one of the most prominent public spaces of the institute so that all who are of that institute derive pride on the kind of intellectual giant which worked there and all who come to the institute know the great learning traditions which were propounded in that institute. Go back to legacy factor or longitudinal thinking. Scientific management had some takers. There were three major theories besides scientific management. One was the bureaucratic theory which was established by Max Weber. The third was principles of general and administrative management, which Henry Foyle talked about. The scientific theory of Frederick Taylor was propounded by him around 1900. It advocated application of the scientific methods to improve productivity. The classical theory was conspicuous by its lack of understanding of anything which had to do with human beings. It was a simple time and motion study. In fact, so far as I am concerned, there was no management in it at all. And if it was a simple time and motion study, then you should be studying the principle of a pulley. And designing a pulley is not management, important as it is. But then again, you can't swim against a trend if everyone says that uh, the scientific methods of improving productivity are the, are the forerunners. Well, then you need to be told that also. That was the core specialization of Frederick Taylor. And if he was to be alive a hundred years later and perhaps be present in this class, he would be surprised that he is supposed to have fathered organization theory. But then what do you do when you don't know your father? You create one. It's important to have a father. At least filling out application forms makes it mandatory to create a father. Orphans have no place in this world. I am not saying it. That's what the practice is. You know, when it is becoming so fashionable to talk of caste census, and I, and I did tell you that management is applied to the current issues, and I did talk of environment, and I did talk of sources of energy, there is no reason why we, we should find any subject a taboo. I have always wondered when the caste census is conducted, which I think is a very fashionable thought with certain segments of the people, how will an orphan define his caste? Or will they have a caste of orphans? And what will they do with the destitutes? Or will they have a caste of the destitutes? But you are not interested in this if you are interested in politics. Because your purpose is not social engineering. Your purpose is to make sure you are on the right side of operating power. One of the outcomes of studying management is to get your lenses clean on decision making and problem solving and understand how decision making is done and decision making is a political process. Which is why, alas, for good or for evil, with joy or sadness, whatever be it, these topics cannot be circuited if you want to study management the way it is. And remember, politics is the control, struggle for the control of the decision making process. In fact, one of the topics which we will not be taking up in these sessions 
is the impact of different disciplines on management. In other words, how far does management borrow from psychology? How far does management borrow from industrial engineering? How far does management borrow from anthropology? How far does it borrow from history? How far does it borrow from systems analysis? There are other disciplines. You can't, you can't study political science without looking at the interface of political science with other areas. And we were discussing this in a small group and somebody said, one of the most important disciplines which make an impact on management is the study of political science. You can't understand management without understanding political science. Now, there are not many takers of that. But remember, management is still a discipline which has to acquire that maturity which comes out of centuries of analysis. Modern management, not conventional management, which I have discussed in the first session itself. Modern management is not even 150 years old. Compare it to the tradition of civil engineering. Compare it to the tradition of history. History has been taught, studied, researched for over 3,000 years as a discipline. Civil engineering has existed as a, as a modern discipline for several centuries. When you look at a discipline which is hardly 100 years old, what is the antiquity of that discipline? So obviously, everyone believes that management originated in his discipline. You talk to an industrial engineer, he believes management began in industrial engineering. You talk to a psychologist, he believes management began from psychology. You talk to a person from systems analysis, he will tell you all management is systems analysis. And the other day I was with a group of economists, they were quite determined that all management began in economics. I was reminded of that uh, telling analogy of six blind men and the elephant. And each one quite convinced he has got the truth. So unless you understand the nature of management, you will also start believing that management originated from the discipline from which you came. What is the trouble with this approach? If you occupy a key position in an organization, then you start selling that approach to everyone. Remember what I said earlier on, going back to the origins of theory, when I told you early examples of management captains of industry. So if you are, a, if you are an industrial engineer, you start telling people, everywhere management is under industrial engineering. Now that's terrible English. It's worse management. And I have known a person who made his career teaching management, propound publicly everywhere Management is under industrial engineering. And a lot of people would believe him because he has held key positions. I hope the new generation of management students and I hope the new generation of practitioners of management will realize that whether management is an old discipline or a new discipline, management is now established enough to do have its own character to have its own nature and management has never been under any discipline. And you did hear me say it's bad English and worse management. Therefore, to understand the theories of organization management, you must understand where the propounders came from. And this is undertaking a critique of that theory. One of the easiest exercises to undertake is to rationalize your own primacy. So I forgive Frederick Taylor for his time and motion study. At least he marked a research beginning, so credit must be given to him. But then the world has moved much beyond that. And what I am trying to tell you is that 
Frederick Taylor did make a contribution to management by optimization of performance of work to achieve one best method. And with all its limitations, Frederick Taylor's contribution to management theory is his emphasis at measurement. Alas, Frederick Taylor did not live long enough to live in the human resources theory era, which hit the other side of the pendulum and people started saying, you can't measure. Remember, if you make a statement which is too bigoted, you will generate its own antithesis. Somebody will get up and say exactly 180 degrees opposite of the same thing. So it is best to propound all theories with a touch of tentativeness, with a touch of humility, and with a genuine attempt to receive feedback. A recognition that after all, you could need an improvement on what you are saying. That is the hallmark of a scholar. He does not make statements directed towards establishing the primacy of his own discipline. The scientific theory of Frederick Taylor, as I said, simplified skilled jobs to unskilled ones and they said, you do this for the best result. You will do as directed. Now, if you come to soldiering, he identified three main reasons for soldiering. Increase in productivity will require fewer workers. Employee would receive same pay for higher productivity. Faster pace would be set as standard and used rule of thumb uh, and wasted time. Used rule of thumb and wasted time was not desirable. In other words, the entire focus of classical theory was on productivity. not national rural employment generation scheme for heaven's sakes. Frederick Taylor would have committed suicide. He believed in no such thing. He could get up and say, give me the results. You know, what you are supposed to do when you get to a sufficiently high rank in the organization. You are supposed to turn around to your subordinates and say, give me results. You know, you, you, you know one of those ugly statements like, Management is getting others to do your work. Whether you get anything out of these sessions or not, at least I hope when you do get somewhere in your life, you will not be the sort of person using these ugly statements. I believe in results. What are you, some sort of God Almighty? I believe in results. I thought I be, you believed in God himself. Sir, how, what should I do to do results? That's your problem. You know, the sheer pathetic character of people in leadership positions who do not know the theory and practice of management and yet who pretend to be taller than titans. The world is full of them. But that is another story. What I want you to understand is time studies required, studying of time workers and to determine the best way. Most mindless jobs could be scientifically done to increase productivity, better than in initiative and incentive method. There, so, time studies led to the four principles of scientific management, replace the rule of thumb work method with methods based on scientific study of the tasks. Now, you can't argue with this. Therefore, it is not as if classical theory does not make a contribution to management. The question is to understand how far it goes and with what. Scientifically select train and develop each worker rather than passively leaving him to train themselves. In other words, there is a conscious intervention. And the remaining two principles are, cooperate with the workers to ensure that the scientifically developed methods are being followed. And it is in this kind of thought that standard operating procedure as a phrase is embedded. There is a best way of doing things. And if you want to survive in the organization, you are supposed to follow that best way and not argue with it. 
at least according to the scientific theory. Divide work nearly equally between managers and workers, so that the managers apply scientific management principles to planning of the work and the workers actually perform the tasks. So, what you have got from me is the essentials of scientific theory of management, the classical theory of management, how, how is it operated, how did it originate, how is it practiced and also we have tried to look at its limitations and look at its strengths. We therefore, now go on to taking a quick look at its drawbacks, which is increase the monotony of work, dehumanized de de work and we move on then to bureaucracy theory, which is by Max Weber. Now, again like the scientific theory, the bureaucracy theory works both ways. It has a strength, it serves a purpose and it has its problems. Your first attempt will be to understand what is something before you can undertake a critique on it. It was proposed by Max Weber in 1909. recognized by bureaucracy as a logical structure for large organizations. Now, the truth is the era in which we live bureaucracy has become an ugly word. In fact, a very common statement would be do not be bureaucratic, but the truth is if you have a group of people working together for achievement of an objective, there will be some kind of bureaucracy. It is inherent. What is a bureaucracy therefore? Bureaucracy is a scalar principle, different levels of work. There is a clear difference between the quality of skill required in placing a chair and in delivering a lecture. Both the qualities are not the same, so there is a hierarchy of work. If there is a hierarchy of work, there will be a hierarchy of command. If there is a hierarchy of command, there will be information flow. If there is information flow, then there, there has to be information collection and information distribution. There has to be supervision. You cannot get away from it. Therefore, the truth is whether you like it or not, bureaucracy is inherent in any group activity. So, you have to recognize that bureaucracy is a logical structure for large organizations. Operations characterized by impersonal rules. Bureaucracy also does not recognize exceptions. Bureaucracy survives on the grand principle, if I do it for you, I will have to do it for everyone. A palpably erroneous assumption, but then there is merit in taking that argument, because bureaucracy believes in creating an impersonal environment. impersonalization and focus on the system. And you will hear a lot of managers claiming they run a systems driven organization. It is a good idea, but is there any limit to the systems driven organization? That is the question. What are the key principles of bureaucracy? Insistence on following standard rules, then at least there are no heartburns. Systematic division of work. There is a principle of hierarchy, knowledge of and training in application of rules, recording and writing of administrative acts, decision, and rules. It will not be a subject of personal memory. It will not be a factor of interpretation. 
if you implement something, there must be the sanction of the competent authority. And above all that, there must be a rational personal administration. It can't be whimsical. There are merits to the system. The merit is it's a pragmatic approach. The focus is on the system rather than the individual. So there is very little scope for playing favorites. There is a sense of equity and fair play. Whatever applies to me applies to everyone. There are demerits too. Demerits are organization tend to become too procedure oriented and therefore the genuine cases of exception go by the sideline. It may lead to inefficiency because so long as you observe the rules, you are safe. Which is why, unusual as it may sound, in a lot of uh, labor unrest situations, the labor resorts to work by rule, something which beats me. How, how can productivity decrease if you work by rule? But it just shows that rules are meant for the average and therefore, if I work by rule, I impede the system. It is, a, it is an agitational technique. We will now resort to work by rule. And that's a classical example of the demerits of uh, the bureaucratic system. The principles of general management then follow. But then, so far we have looked at two theories. The classical theory, which was propounded by Frederick Taylor, the bureaucratic theory, which was propounded by Max Weber, and both have their merits and demerits, and both of them exist today. It is just that neither of them can run whole organizations. It is great to follow the classical theory up to a point on a shop floor level. At least the standards of performance are measured. It is great to follow some bureaucratic principles at a larger level of the organization because it helps to weave together large numbers together. In any area, you will realize that there are merits and demerits. Above all, it is the application of these principles which brings about the operational advantage or disadvantage of the theory. So, we have looked at theories. We will stop there for this session. We shall pick it up with principles of general management hereafter.